charity and giving. They want to shift it. And they want to make sure that the, 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 the world's wealthiest and any, and any of the other people who have a lot of money, that they would inspire them to give more, to establish plans, and to give in a smarter way. Signatories, this is their uh, website, it's not a statement. Signatories fund a diverse range of issues of their choosing. Those who join the giving pledge are, are encouraged to write a letter explaining the decision to engage deeply and publicly in philanthropy and describing the causes that motivate them. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, that, you know, we have rich people who are looking to give. And it's not just Bill Gates, and it's not just Warren Buffett, there's a few other on there. Larry Page is on there. Um, 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 uh, Ellison was on there. You know, and bless their heart for the vision and mission and seeking to inspire others by their example of giving so they can make the world a better place. And making the world a better place is a lofty and noble goal, and, and I applaud the giving pledge for its willingness and efforts to improve the world by pronouncing and exemplifying the attribute of giving and liberality. In a small sense, in a small sense, to a small degree, the idea of giving that they're doing speaks to the first and most outstanding philanthropist. Amen? It is not Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. It is not any recent global or political leader. It isn't any tremendous historical figure with earthly ties to an earthly kingdom. The first and greatest giver is God. The first and greater giver is God. No one else. And Paul points this out in our scripture reading this morning. Paul glorifies God by announcing Jesus' importance for change in himself and in others. Paul, he said, I want to tell people that God is the only one that should deserve our, 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 our praise and our worship because Jesus has effected change in himself and others. Let's go back to our scripture reading, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 12 to 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And if you're there, say amen, church. We're still turning. That's all right. Amen. We have the screen as well if you need it there. Um, all right. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to read from your Bibles, praise the Lord. If you have your, your electronic devices, I, I know some do. Go ahead and read from there. We also have the screen. I'll be reading up here from, from, from the Bible here. I'm reading from the ESV. And it says here, Paul says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I, because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full of acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, of whom I am chief. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, and the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So what is happening in the text? What's happening in the text? Paul is thanking Christ Jesus, his Lord. And the apostle lived in the mindset of thankfulness and gratitude. He thanks Christ Jesus, the Lord. Why? Why does he thank God? Why does he thank Jesus, his Lord? Because Jesus counted him. Jesus regarded him. Jesus judged Paul faithful. And the idea that Paul is communicating is that Jesus has thoughts about and for Paul. In this, we can sense that Jesus has a calling and a purpose for Paul. However, it begins with Jesus. It begins with Jesus counting, regarding, considering Paul. In Jesus' mind, there is a purpose and calling for Paul. But this is surprising, considering that Paul says he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. And Paul does not mince words regarding his formal life. In fact, he seems to claim all three terms. 
He was a blasphemer. This has religious overtones. In regards to Paul, Paul formally blasphemed God through his actions of persecution against God's people. So blasphemer and a persecutor. His irreverent attitude made him an insolent opponent, an injurious one. And this is the same word here in Romans 1.30. Romans 1.30, we know the text, where Paul talks about individuals who change the truth of God into a lie. He employs, Paul employs the word in that list that describes those who have gone against God. In fact, Paul here admits that in his former life, in his former life, he exhibited one of the qualities of those who rebelled against God. Paul does not shy away from his past mistakes. Paul owns them. Yes, he says, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent. I attacked God and attacked his people. But God showed Paul mercy. Amen. God is merciful. He is merciful to this Paul who is blasphemous, persecuting, and insolent. Paul states that he acted ignorantly in, ignorantly in unbelief. And I believe right here, I believe Paul is not giving himself a pass for his former actions. Instead, Paul is saying that the root of his issues was unbelief. Unbelief. He may have acted ignorantly, and this echoes the phrase we talked about this a few weeks ago, unintentional sin. But the qualifier of unbelief, the qualifying term of unbelief, lays the guilt of the act of the sin squarely on Paul. Paul says, I did it in unbelief. And this truth only amplifies, though, God's mercy upon Paul's life. Wow. God gives Paul what he does not deserve. He gives him mercy. Church, God gives us mercy every day. We live under the umbrella of a merciful God. This is the thought of Jesus as opposed to Paul's admittance. While Paul admits that he acted ignorantly in unbelief, Jesus regards him for ministry. Wow. Here he is acting in unbelief, acting a blasphemer or persecutor, and this is the point. But Jesus regards him for ministry. And look at the connection between these two points. Paul realizes that his formal life of unbelief opposed God, but God's mercy every step of the way is there giving Paul salvation. At the same time, salvation in Jesus gives him a place in ministry of God. Jesus regarded Paul as faithful, not because Paul's faithfulness it's not because of that. On the contrary, Paul's life before his conversion was proved to be unfaithful to God. Instead, the mercy of God. Jesus regarding Paul, looking at Paul, and then placing him in ministry, even though he was in unbelief. And now here he is writing this letter to Timothy. He's writing this letter, and he is moved into faithfulness to God because of the mercy of God. You see, it began with Jesus. Amen? It didn't begin with Paul. It began with Christ. And in fact, Jesus, in fact, in fact Paul says this. The result is that this truth that Jesus regarded me, that Jesus was merciful to me, even though I was acting a fool, that he says, this truth has strengthened Paul. He says, I thank him who has given me strength. <laughs> he calls Jesus the one who strengthens him. And Paul uses this specific word here to trigger the memory of, of Timothy. And the connection here is really found in Acts 9.22. And the passage context is Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Uh, Christ has confronted Paul regarding his persecution of his people. Paul is struck blind. And after rising from the ground, the men traveling with him led him by the hand to Damascus. And Paul spent three days without sight and did not eat or drink. And there during that time, the Lord appears uh, in a vision to a disciple named Ananias, telling him to go to Saul and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, Brother Ananias had a big issue, Right? It would be a big issue. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> hold on, Lord. He tells Jesus, he, as if Jesus didn't know, right? <laughs> he tells Jesus, don't you know Saul has been persecuting all of us? <laughs> all those who call upon the Lord, say, don't you know? He knows. <laughs> Jesus knows Ananias. But the Lord assures Ananias, he says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. 
And for some days, Paul was with the disciples. And then he began to proclaim Jesus. And the text tells us, now, uh, Acts 9.22, that Paul increased all the more in strength. Same word as in verse 12. So Paul here is recounting in a very simple manner what, how Christ called him into the gospel. And so here, Paul says, this is what happened to me, Timothy. And so what does Paul think about his conversion testimony? So he said, I've confessed, I've told you, verses 12 and 13, in a very simplistic manner, my change, how God changed my heart. And so what, is this, what does Paul think about his gospel conversion? He points out that God's grace, verse 14, overflowed or was exceeding abundantly. Paul is overwhelmed by God's grace. God, the grace of God just flowed upon him. Imagine an empty cup sitting under an open faucet, and the water begins, someone turns on the, the faucet, and it begins to fill the empty vessel as it sits under the faucet. At one point, the cup is half full, but the water continues to flow from the tap into the cup. Finally, the water has reached the rim of the cup. So someone, so, should someone close the faucet? No. It remains open. As a result, the cup overflows with water over and over again. And the faucet just keeps pouring water, keeps pouring water into this filled vessel. Let me tell you, church, we are standing under the spout of God's outpouring grace. It meets us in our emptiness. It fills our life and even overflows our capacity to receive it. Man, grace over and over again. It is grace. It goes beyond human thought. It is partnered with faith and love, according to the text. Grace, faith, and love is the perfect trifecta of God's character. And they are given as reasons why Paul's blasphemous, persecuting, and insolence is surrendered. God's grace melted Paul's stubborn heart. But Paul isn't the only one with a stubborn heart. Our hearts, if left to themselves, will reveal their brokenness in an unhealthy manner. What Paul wrote... In Romans 5.20, that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Amen? Amen? So the antithesis of sin is what? Grace, according to Romans 5.20. It's not obedience, because we cannot obey out of our own strength. Grace has to change us. Grace has to empower us. Grace has to move us. The antithesis of sin is God's grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. The grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace that is greater than all our sins. And look, grace brings forth faith and love. And this speaks to the vertical relationship one has with God. It is faith in God. And at the same time, love speaks about our relationship with one another. So these are the authentic marks of a Christian. Grace changes our standing before God, and it affects our change, affects a change in our relational position with God and with our brothers and sisters. Amen? This is the thing about Jesus. He is too much. We don't deserve it. I've been, I, I, we've been bad to another person. We've done wrong to another person. We've been wrong. And why should we experience grace? And why should grace go to other people through my life? But that's Jesus. He is too much. The overflowing of grace that brings about change in our lives is too much. This grace accounts for our past mistakes. It also handles with no problem our present situation. Moreover, it prepares us for our future service. No wonder this is amazing grace. This is too much, God, too much. So what's the purpose of overflowing grace? What's the purpose? So we see... Paul, in 12 and 13, giving a brief synopsis on his conversion. We see that uh, he attributes this to the grace of God, melting his heart, melting his stubbornness, and then it extends in the way that he lives with God and he lives with other people. And so what's the purpose, though, of overflowing grace? Why is God in this text saying, Paul, I am doing this in your life? Paul tells us that the word he is about to say is faithful, trustworthy. That's in verse 15. He's using the word faithful here, trustworthy, because he wants to say that this, what I'm about to say, Paul is saying, that the word that I'm about to say is dependable, reliable, and accurate. All right? 
And so if I was to use our present day vernacular, it will be that you can take this to the bank. Amen. <laughs> it is beyond question. That's right. There is no debate. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, a lot of our young people today, no doubt. <laughs> you know, so here it is. If we want something reliable and true as a compass for our lives, we must cast our anchor upon the truth of Paul's inspired thought in the coming words. This uh, word is faithful. It is trustworthy. But not only is it faithful and trustworthy, also what he is saying is it is worthy of all acceptance. So we have this word that Paul is about to say that it is faithful, but not only faithful, it is worthy. And so worthy carries the idea of deserving because of its high comparable value. It is deserving because it is, it is beyond any, uh, any value that we have here on planet Earth. Thus, not only is this saying dependable and trustworthy, it is also valuable and deserving of our acceptance. And the value of this saying cannot be overestimated. If we want something in a high in value in our lives, Paul is saying, I'm about to give you the gold. I'm about to give you the gold. And so the reliable and valuable saying is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Amen. Amen. This is the gospel truth. This is reliable. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Jesus left a place of indescribable glory with the purpose of saving sinners. He would endure the rigors of poverty, persecution, and the pains of a sinful world. He would experience the pressures of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means uh, wine press. In this garden, the enemy pressed upon Jesus the temptation of going home because he was still sinless. Did you know that there are three temptations according to Desire of Ages that, that was pressed upon Christ there in the garden of Gethsemane? One of them was, you go home. Don't worry. You are sinless, Jesus. You can still go home and be okay. You'll be accepted in heaven. That was a temptation. Jesus said no. Father, let not this cup pass from me, but thy will be done. Another temptation is that the world will not value his sacrifice. He will be dying for an ungrateful life. Look at your disciples. They're sleeping on you right now. Don't you know that one of the disciples is coming right now with soldiers to arrest you? Don't you know that you're about to be placed upon a cross and mocked and defrauded and going through a farce of a trial? Don't you know that you, no one here will regard you? Your sacrifice will mean nothing to them. Temptation number two. But Christ said, not my will, Lord, but thine. The last temptation was the possibility that by taking upon himself the sins of the world, this act would create an eternal fissure between him and the Father. You will be separated from the Father throughout eternity if you take sin upon yourself. You see how the devil was making sure that he didn't go through it? <laughs> he was trying his hardest. <laughs> but he said, you will, it will be, you will be split forever if you do this. And, and that's when you know, the Bible says that you know, an angel came down <laughs> and strengthened him. And he said, not my will, but thine. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Paul realized that Jesus came into the world to save him, a sinner, him, a sinner. And in Paul's estimation, the chief of sinners. He doesn't just say, I'm a sinner. I am the chief. In other words, I've done the best. I'm the best at it. And just like Paul, we should recognize our needy, sinful condition. No one is better than another in this place of worship, amen? No one is better. We are sinners who desperately needed Jesus to come into this world. I think of that as I was reviewing this so during the week, I was thinking of that song by, by, by Elvis Presley, Who Am I? Who am I that the king will bleed and die for? Right? Who am I? Who am I that he would pray not my will but thine, Lord? Who am I? Who am I? I am a sinner. However, Paul continues stating the reason why he received mercy from Jesus. So Jesus gave him mercy. And the reason 
If we read the text carefully, verse 16, the reason is that Jesus might display uh, our long suffering, all of his long suffering with everyone. Jesus appointed Paul in a place of ministry and service to show, to display, to demonstrate to all that God can take a chief sinner and turn him into a gospel minister. And, 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 and I was like, that God can take someone who was in the pit and then move him into a place of ministry. And this transformation in Paul's life is an example, is an example to those who are about to believe. Many are looking and searching for God. They're on the cusp of giving their hearts to Jesus. And God has redeemed us from sin. And we are his case study for those who are seeking salvation. God presents us as an example of his transformative power to those seeking redemption. Amen? And like the giving pledge and mission and statement to inspire others to live differently than they have lived, God uses redeemed, broken sinners to demonstrate that Jesus came into the world to sinners of whom I am chief. Jesus touts us. Jesus puts us forth. Jesus, this is my proof that I can change your life. And we can come to him and share that. So here, Paul then breaks forth in praise to God. He calls God the king of ages. God reigns forever and ever. He is not a human king. Our king is divine. He is immortal. Human kings die by natural or unnatural causes, but not our God, amen. He's beyond any death or decay. Our king is invisible. I have to ask my question, what are you talking about here, Paul? I mean, the first thought, obviously, is like, well, that means that we can't see him. But, I mean, you know, as I, I had to go, I went through scripture a little bit, just as you know, Paul uses this word in several other places. So what does this mean? Well, let's walk through scripture. I mean, I got about 10 minutes. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We know the text. Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Real quick context, context here matters, of course. <clears throat> context is king and understanding, you know, the, the, the passage. And so here Paul is talking about, you know, that God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and all righteousness. And, um, and, 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 and they can know God. They can know God through nature. So there's a general revelation of who God is. And if they are willing and open to accept that, then something can happen in their lives. Look at verse 20. Um, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So in other words, it seems like the invisible here is talking about the characteristics of God. His invisible attributes that can be seen. So it's invisible, but it can be seen. Wow, amazing language there, huh? Let's go on to, let's, let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Brother Paul, Brother Paul, Colossians chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 15. Colossians is a powerful letter. It's a very deep letter. And it talks about the, the importance of Jesus throughout all of the universe. And so here, Paul argues and saying that, that, that Jesus Christ, verse 15, he says, he is, context again. Let me give you context real quickly. So before, the, before verse 15, he talks about how, how God has transferred those who believe in Jesus into, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen. So God has done something. All right, and then he says, he is the image, verse 15, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We're not going to explain firstborn of all creation, but it talks about that Jesus is the image of the likeness of God. And in Paul's time, uh, the word image was used for likenesses placed on coins, portraits, and statues. It carries the idea of correspondence to the original. It is the nearest equivalent uh, in ancient Greek to our modern photograph. Jesus is the perfect representation of God. So if you want to know who God is, if you want to know this, this person who has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, look at Jesus and you'll see him. He is the image of the invisible God. And then let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter, I know you know the text, but it's always good to read it, amen? Hebrews chapter 11, 11, this is the chapter on faith. This is a who's who of faithful witnesses in the Old Testament. And so here, Hebrews chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 27. Uh, we're reading the section on, on, on the faith of Moses. Moses, all right, so verse 27, um, 
By faith, he, referring to Moses, left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, of the pharaoh. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Same word there. So, so Moses saw the invisible. He saw, because, uh, and, and because of this, he was not afraid to say, Oh, Pharaoh, I'm not interested in what you have. None of that matters. You claim to have position of power and glory. Nothing compared to he who is power and glory. <laughs> So in other words, he saw the, 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 the character of God. He saw the power of God. He saw God's invisible attributes. And so Moses says, no, nope, I'm not buying into that. I'm not buying into it. And so we see here that this God, this, this God who is a, a, a divine king forever and ever, he is immortal, he is invisible. He's also the only wise God, the only God who has put together this plan of salvation. This idea of saving mankind, saving us from our, our, our pit of sin and bring us to a place of, 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 of love and grace into his uh, window. We're so happy by that. The wisdom of salvation is the product of the supreme God. And it demonstrates God's extravagance. He has given all. He has not skipped out. He has put forth everything. The Bible says you know, that Christ came into this world, in a world that rejected him, that didn't love him, but he came. I love the way that you know, my favorite author writes, you know, that Christ came and gave all, gave all, everything. Nothing was held back to save you and I. We are recipients of the greatest, most extravagant plan that has been, ever been devised the plan of salvation, and I'm so thankful for that. Brothers and sisters, this Sabbath morning, Paul wrote this section of his letter to glorify God. And the reason for this is that Jesus saves us. He saves us. Moving us from condemned to saved is an impossible act for us to do. We cannot change our position. We cannot change our life. Can, can an Ethiopian change his skin color? Can a uh, leopard change his spots? No, don't even think about it. Don't even entertain the thought. But the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Christ has given us life. The divine and holy God accomplishes the transformation of a sinner into a saint. Our redemption should result in rejoicing and praising to God. Our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ, thought of us, was too much for us, touts us, and directs our praise toward God. Jesus thought of you. And it was a lot. It didn't matter. He was willing to go all the way. Everything. Lay it on the line. Because that's what he thought of you. And then he presents you. He gives you as a witness to the world. You see, the reason why we are saved and redeemed by Christ is for missiological purposes. We are sent to go forth to tell other people, hey, Christ fixed my life. I'm sure he can do the same for you. <laughs> he, he changed me. I'm sure he can do the same for you. <laughs> I know you're going through a lot, brother. I know you're going through a lot, sister. But, but my God, who has been with me, that when I was going through a lot, he, he came and delivered me. You know what? He can deliver you as well. And so we are here to celebrate that that Christ came and gave all, gave all. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your love and grace and for your mercy and your kindness. We are so unworthy, Lord, but you have done it. You have expressed your thoughts for us in Jesus. You have given so much, too much, really, to redeem us. And now you are using us, Lord, as vessels, Lord, for your grace to other people, Lord, that you have redeemed us, you have saved us. And now, Lord, we want to praise you. We want to give you our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Bless us now, Lord, as we continue in our service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
God 